You're welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. My next set of guests, uh, we're joined by Joe Jackson, Director of Business Operations, Delex Finance Limited. Thank you very much for joining us. And many apologies. We're hoping that we could dedicate one hour or a bit more than that for this very important issue. But we have 30 minutes. Let's see how we deal with it. And of course, because it's a, a, a pending issue, we will continue to look at it. Still here in the studio is Kofi Bento, Dr. Michael Pesa White, and Abdul Malik Kwekubako, editor in chief of the New Crusading Guide newspaper. Who, who uh, will not be commenting on this matter? So uh, that you get time and space. Uh, don't you have money I, I thought that <laughs> <could be added. laughs> I thought that could be added. you issued it to me privately, <laughs> privately, and I was still going to bring you in anyway. Yeah, you get space, time okay. and space. Okay, all right. I just want to get it. Uh, all right. So Kuku says I should give all the time to you for what you can do about it, and of course, Kofi Bentel has some uh, good expertise in this area, and Dr. White will also share some bits on that as well. So, um, over three hundred. Microfinance institutions had their licenses revoked yesterday. I think that's a good place to start. 347 revoked. And question is, how did that just happen? There are some experts that say this is long overdue. You are in the sector. Some say this was predictable. <coughs> we expected it. Once the seven banks went down, we knew that this was going to happen because shortly after the banks went down there was almost like a meltdown on the financial institutions and as a lawyer i'm speaking on fact mm -hmm. we have clients they are knocking on your doors every day this microfinance company can't pay my my money back we want you to chase them up and then you are chasing up making demands and fighting just yesterday we are reading also uh, some uh, indum's uh, company gold coast some have won cases and they are seeking monies and all of that. Did you expect this? <laughs> Did you expect it to be this bad? I think that should be the question. I actually think it's going to get worse. Whoa. Yes. You, <laughs> it's, first of all, it was way, way long overdue. And, and if we thought the mess at the, um, at the universal banks was bad, Remember that you're dealing with a lot more people at this level. No. Okay. So, well, the investor banks hold 80% yes. of the funds in the economy. And 20% and is held by those uh, further down the, 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 the financial pyramid. But they are now holding 70% of the individual counts. So, you're going to get a lot more people affected a lot more people screaming in pain because they can't get their money and then the net effect at the bottom of the pyramid is actually worse and we could we, we, we've been debating this with the central bank that yes you've secured 80 percent of the uh deposits in the economy but you haven't secured 80 percent of the people mm. And this is, and the situation was long overdue. And it was made worse as far back as the 8th of January, the central bank announced that it was going to conduct the forms in, reforms in this, sect, uh, in this sector. 8th of January. Action was taken on the 31st of May. May. Five months later. What happened? Each day. Uncertainty. And the uncertainty and the fear and panic made it worse. And the, and, the, and the sad part is that some of the institutions that were, could have survived and were solvent have been driven under by the fear and panic. Okay. So uh, remember that when we go back to UT and Capital Bank, by the time you hit Consolidated Bank, there was massive fear and panic. And there was a major liquidity crisis. So even institutions that were not as badly mismanaged, even institutions that were not uh, 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 that reckless, were suffering. And you got, we, we've got to accept that if everybody comes to knock on your door and ask for their money, 
at the same time. At the same time, you cannot pay. So this fear and panic where and 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 and, and it was real. Only the very strongest institutions have survived. And you're going to find that very few institutions are still alive and, and, and strong and able to open their doors. You say this is going to get even worse. And yes. that's, I, I think that's, that's really chilling. Because even at this point, the institutions that you refer to as those that are strong, yes. how much guarantees do we have? Because once again, I can say on authority that some of them, as the, the, their clients come for the monies, asking for the monies, they give you datelines. They ask you, oh, we can pay, we can give you installment, I will schedule the payment. And a lawyer gets happy, he says, okay, my client is going to get their money. The deadlines, they never fulfill them. They, they just pass and nothing gets done. They give excuses and they try to link them to the globalized situation as far as the country is concerned. So when you say it's going to get even worse, what are we looking at? Let me explain this. A lot of these institutions were actually dead men walking. Hmm. The customers were not getting their money. Now that it has been revoked, now it is formal. All right. So remember that those, that the, those whose deposits are guaranteed in the first place are those who have savings and current accounts. The problem is the number of them who have investments fixed deposits, etc., in these institutions. And, and that's where the problem is. And these are the individuals who can't get their money out. So what is going to happen now <clears throat> is that once this happens, the fear and panic is going to ratchet up another notch. And maybe another notch. And all institutions are going to start to feel the pressure. What we need the central bank to do for those institutions that you think are strong, inject some liquidity. You've got to. Everywhere there's been a crisis of this, this widespread, from the US through the Nigerian playbook, which we seem to be using, everywhere there was an injection of liquidity. We can't, we can't on one hand, carry these reforms. And let's be all be clear, the reforms were absolutely necessary. And for better or for worse, you have to commend the current Bank of Ghana regime mm. for being bold enough to carry out those reforms. I, I'm, I'm on record to say some of the previous regimes, they should be horsewhipped. Because by not taking any action, when we knew as far back as 2014 that there were problems in the sector, they made it progressively worse <coughs> and worse and worse. And even threw in more licenses without cleaning up the system. So some, some of our previous governors and deputy governors, they have a, they have a question or two to answer. Mm. But my challenge is that you're doing the right thing, but there are unintended consequences. And you don't want to bring so much pain to the bottom. With the universal banks, you're right. They've secured 80% of the deposits. But what about all them individuals? And as for this story about not losing jobs, I beg you, the, uh, what, what, the, the, there's a term I like, go and tell it to the Marines. Go and tell it to the Marines. That's a quick one and see story. Well, unless you say the jobs were lost because you know all, a lot of them were dead men walking. So the jobs were lost already. So <laughs> there are no new jobs going to be lost. Mm. But you can't close some of these institutions to fiscally went down and shut the doors. What are we talking about? I think if we're talking about jobs were lost already, then we we'll be, should be referring to the, the number that were already insolvent and exactly. had, had already ceased. But, but there were some that That's were 100 working. 155 yes. of the 347. So, so the majority were still, the doors were still so open. So I'm reading the Bank of Ghana's, you know, Q&A that it seeks to as it were, make it easier for you to understand what is going on. And I can't believe that all the 14 questions, questions that are asked in the negative, but the answers are all positives, including what you just mentioned, that tell it to the Marines. Job losses, 
They say they don't expect that yeah. there'll be... I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. And you see, it's easy to talk about it. What about the cleaners? What about the security men? What about... You know, this, the, the, the knock-on effect is so huge. And, 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 and you know, uh, uh, what we don't realize is that at this moment, the, finance, the bottom of the financial pyramid is in disarray. Very few institutions are standing upright and going about their business. Almost no lending to SMEs. Ask anybody in the street. There's no lending to SMEs. This is a real crisis of a different sort. You may have secured the top, but what about the bottom? There are larger numbers. Yeah, and, 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 and so uh, there's a certain, I think there's a certain head being buried in the sand approach. Oh, we've solved the bigger problem. This one will take care of itself. It won't take care of itself. Because they are real lives, real people, real, and, and they are less able to survive <laughs> the shocks that you're throwing out. Okay, so... I think you, you are really getting us to get uh, be really scared about the prospects. But I take note that this last month, the IMF seems to show a lot of positive on Ghana when they say that Ghana will grow faster than any other economy this year. That's the IMF saying so. So irrespective of all what you talk about, 80% of the is it deposits that were being held by the universal banks and the uh, effect and then the knock-on effect on the financial uh, uh, entities and even the the thing about this scare also affecting every other financial institution in very substantial way you say worst times are, ex are ahead but this is what the IMF says you know, I say, aha, listen here, at the top, we're going to get oil revenue growth. So if you're in the oil sector, a few other sectors, life is good. The macro numbers the, 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 from the top, they look good. But you see, the commercial banks we're talking about that you secured <coughs> don't lend to the granite seller in the streets. They've never lent to the granite seller. That is why we have microfinance. That is why we have money lenders. That is why we have non-banks. Because we admit that on a very real level, the engine of growth, and we love to talk about SMEs being the engine of growth. We love to talk about the fact that more jobs are created at the SME level than will ever be created at the large corporate level. Nobody is lending to them. If you're an advertising company today and you get a contract, who's going to give you money to finance that contract before you get paid? You have to go to the good old friends, family, etc. Nobody's giving you money at that level. So what you have is that, is this divergence between how people feel at the bottom, where there's a certain, there's a certain sense of malice and drifting because things are not happening. And yet at the top, Everything seems to be, oh, it's cool. Ghana is growing. There's some money flowing. The money is not flowing to the bottom. Because the banks that should take liquidity from excess to places of, 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 uh, of, uh, of scarcity, part of that system is broken at the bottom. But it's so, not as if all the microfinance entities have been wiped out. There are 137 in good standing. As we speak, there are 31 microcredit companies. So these will do the job you are talking about, lending to the, the, the Time SMEs. Out. Time out. We spoke about the liquidity crisis. The 137 are standing because they were so prudent, they have enough cash to keep paying their depositors. But do they have enough cash to lend? And I say emphatically, no. I sit in a non-bank, and we are one of the strongest, right? And yet I know that the inflows 
are not coming like the way they used to. We're able to pay our depositors because we're just simply prudent and we have a reputation for prudence. And it's the same elsewhere. Are we lending as much as we, we used to? No. Far from it. And when you, you take all these problems together, we have, for example, we've withdrawn from lending to SMEs. We don't lend to SMEs, period. We don't. If you've hmm. got support, you will do it. If you've got support, oh, there's okay. huge demand. Okay. There's huge demand, but I'm less able to buy money. Listen, all, we, all these financial institutions do is to trade money. They buy and they sell. And the process of buying and selling lubricates the economy. And if you are so, it's just like you, 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 you are uh, uh, Unilever. And an external shock says that you can't buy palm oil. And whatever you do, you can't buy palm oil. You can't produce key soap. So if, what, however large the demand for key soap is, you can't do anything about it. Okay, just hold on briefly. And, and, and Kofi, the, the bank asks the question, what happens in the areas that had limited access to services of mainstream financial institutions? <laughs> because now you are taking such a chunk yeah. away, particularly the, the microfinance and institutions where the ones like, you know, Mr. Jackson just said, you know, inter interface yeah. with the people directly and support their businesses. They were all over the place. Now, what has happened? The number that is gone, will it still affect this situation? This is the answer. We do not expect this to affect the financial inclusion agenda. While these institutions were licensed to promote the financial inclusion agenda, the majority of them veered off their mandate and rather pursued their own agenda of obtaining funds from retail and institutional sources and providing loans at prohibitively high cost, as well as diverting, diverting much of the funds they obtain to their private ventures. Secondly, weak capitalization of these... Okay, so what do you say? Actually, that's true. Um, I happen to know that because of a number of situations. Mm. What was happening is that a lot of these people who were supposed to give credit to the lower levels, they mocked up the money, and then they or the owners engaged in all kinds of businesses. Some people had 10 different kinds of companies. They were spending it on their own businesses and not necessarily lending. Unfortunately, this um, section of that industry was supposed to take care of what the Susu people were doing, but mm. they never did. So the Susu people remained. Today, they are still there. Mm. They've been weakened, yes, but the point about this is true, that they were not doing their job anyway. So withdrawing them is not going to have such a huge effect. All right, There will be some effect. The point here is this, they were spending it, this person has one microfinance, then he goes to start a water company, starts a transport company, that same person, that's a lot of the cases, that's what was happening. My brother here is right for the most, but let me say this, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all doom and gloom because this is surgery without anesthesia, <laughs> all right? And the soldiers understand it. If you go to war and you don't prepare, okay? What happens is that when somebody is shot, you have to cut the person, take out the bullet. Otherwise, they will die. Surgery without anesthesia is difficult but necessary. If you do it right, people recover. Although there will be a lot of pain. The pain is what we are going through. The next good news is this. The biggest wave of panic has happened. That is when the takeovers and everything happened. And there's a run on the banks, mm. like we've talked, it's happened across the last year. And the people are still feeling the pain. You and I as lawyers, and myself as somebody who was a bit Doesn't connected. Doesn't this sound to you like the entire financial you know, it, sector being collapsed? You see, because under, of time. Because, under, under bug and by bug itself? Because of time, I don't want to go to the BOG, fight, I then. mean. You yes, go ahead. But look, if you ask me, I, I can tell you exactly <coughs> where this problem started. The BOG had no business selling licenses the way they did. I won't go there. Let me continue with my trend. So I'm saying... The wave of major pain has happened. Let me give you the good news. The government has planned, budgeted, to spend at least a billion dollars, okay, in these takeovers and recoveries. The banking system is extremely linked in this country. If the government spends the money that they have budgeted to spend for these takeovers, then we will ameliorate the problem. I am getting a lot of, you know, People come in and say, we are not getting our money. They were banking with, you know, registered companies, banks that have been taken over. You know the stories, you know. And I had 
money, let's say in UT Bank, or I had money in some other bank that there has been taken go. over, and I'm not getting my money. So where is the money the government, you know, put out? Now, liquidity is important, and the government must put up that money and lower the problem. And then again, you see the 137 that are left. That's a very important point there. We are not focusing enough on them. You had a whole wave of about 10 years of terrible mismanagement and no regulation or weak regulation. These 137 stood in those times and managed themselves so well, they are still standing. He was saying, we don't lend to SMEs anymore. And I made the point, if you are supported, you will. This is where the government should put out their names. Who are the 137? You put out the names of 300 who are gone. Put out the names of the 137 or so who are standing because then they are shown to be the ones who know how to manage and give them the money. Like you said, in the U.S., in every place where these things happen, the government pumps liquidity. Give the liquidity to these 137. They've shown they can manage themselves in crisis. And then you're going to have a situation where they can take up some of the problem in the system. So I'm saying a number of things. One, the takeovers have happened. It's painful, but we have CBG today. The government should put the money in CBG and let people it's get the their money. It's the most difficult thing to resolve now, not the question of attitudes and perceptions, because you already had a Ghanaian who was not interested in your financial se sector. We knew how the savings culture was very, very low. How do we regain that trajectory that was beginning to come up, that people were now getting confidence, going to the bank instead of putting the money in their... You, you won't get it in bed. the short term. Again, it's surgery without anesthesia. You will lose a lot of blood. And, and we don't have time to go through this, but yes, we had a poor savings culture. It started healing. This has damaged it. It has been severely damaged. It will take a long time to get that blood back. So let's just accept that that damage has been done. But I'm saying let's not do more damage. Let us recover as much as we can recover. Because people actually put real money in some of these places. Mm -hmm. Give them back the money. Like you said, you are going to you know, you know, re recapitalize these banks, etc. It will lower the panic. And then highlight the companies that are good in terms of managing people's money. So now we will know where to take our money. And support them to do what all these others should have done. So it was necessary. It happened too late. But it is happening now. It is a good thing. It will be painful. It has already been painful. I believe if the government takes certain steps, the pain will go down and not rather go up. I hope your fears will not materialize. <laughs> Dr. Professor hopes. White. Yes. When the seven banks, you know, went down, we know up to this point mm. that the receivers have managed to recover 731 million out of 10.1 billion funds yeah. that were advanced to their customers customers of those banks what is the guarantee that depositors what is going to happen to these financial institutions will be any better because nobody is excited about this news if 731 million is all we can recover over this period where we are chasing 10.1 billion and the state had pumped in over 12 billion is it you're claiming 13 in some estimates 13 in some right estimates. i mean estimates are running well, from 9 to 13. okay well thank you i mean i think that yes there is a surgery without anesthesia but mm -hmm. there is also also the higher probability that surgery without anesthesia leads to more death than surgery with anesthesia. So let's be, let's be clear on that. Anesthesia is where you prepare. <laughs> so let's, let's be clear on that. Yeah. But I think that um, when we talk about closure of, I mean, financial institutions, it may look or it may sound or it may, it may evoke the images of an authority going to close a building, lock it with a padlock. But essentially, in reality, what it means is that people going home without food, people going home without salaries, people going without accessing credit to do their businesses. What I think is lacking in, in the Bank of Ghana's approach is that it is unable to humanize its reforms. They appear to be this kind of um, commando approach to the reforms that has no human face whatsoever. There are two instruments available to the bank. One, is, one could be punitive, the other, other could be incentive. Okay. Punitive is the route they have taken now. 
let's punish these guys for not doing so well. But what about the other side, the incentive side? And the incentive side is not to incentivize people who are not already doing well. But why don't we proceed by incentivizing those we think are doing very well in order to shift all the businesses and the, the small businesses and individuals to whom they lend to those areas whilst we claw down on those that we think are not performing at all or those who are engaged in what uh, Kofi described as taking the money and getting into some other businesses. In the end, this closure affects lots of jobs. Mm whether we like it or not. I mean, I have heard the, from the, I've read from the statement that there will be no job losses. The day after tomorrow, people are not going to go to work. That's <laughs> a fact. The end of the month, they are not going to get salaries. That's a fact. When UT and others went down, we got an indication that some of their workers are now on the street selling, I mean, all kinds of things. It's a fact that they've lost their jobs. And these things have psychological ramifications also for people. You see, the state exists because its citizens must live and live well. Mm. But your, your statements are saying that they are looking at punitive and a commando attitude instead of, you know, also incentive approach may not be accurate because this is what they say. That prior to the revocation of the licenses, the Bank of Ghana gave the owners, the management of these institutions several opportunities as provided by law to take steps to rectify the identified regulatory violations and other supervisory concerns raised by the Bank of Ghana. The institutions whose licenses have been revoked, however, failed to take the steps to address their insolvency and other relevant issues. As mentioned, a significant number of these institutions had already ceased operations and had locked up their offices, denying their customers of access to their funds in contravention of the law to ensure their orderly exits and to protect the public and the financial system from further uh, dealings with these institutions, the Bank of Ghana has revoked their licenses. Well, for the 155 or so, mm. that's, I mean, by the statement, we're already dormant. I mean, it does, it does appear to me that by default, they were out of business. But what okay. about the rest? Mm -hmm. The same cannot be said of the rest. And even if the same can be said of the rest, that is the side of the Bank of Ghana story. You see, we must act as a developing country that is trying to develop indigenous businesses. We must work with them to grow them. We must, implementers and regulators must work with them to grow them. You don't stay completely far off and then draw the hammer as and when you think that they've gone wrong. Because in the end, the people who work within those institutions, they are not only citizens, they are also eventually the people... Sorry, Professor, but mm. we fail to work with them to grow them. Mm. But that is and what I'm saying. And now we have a problem mm. with our, that, on our hands. But that is what That's I'm saying. That's why you without anesthesia can That is what I'm saying. That we failed it. So what do we do now? The, it, it, are you saying the Bank of Ghana failed to work with them? Yes. Well, if the Bank of Ghana failed to work with them, then there must be a question about the innovative and creative thinking within the bank itself. And maybe the question should be questions about how it happened in those days so we can avoid it in future. But what we need to understand is that we came to a position where we had these toxic banks. Okay, in Imani, we wrote a paper called Lactogen Banks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had a problem. <coughs> Were you going to just try See, and Kofi, nobody is, nobody is mm. saying that we don't have a problem. But let's also get it it's clear. Correct. There is no if, one, if, there is if no if I one understand solution. You clearly, if I understand you clearly, you are tending to support the viewpoint that says, instead of pumping 11 billion into collapsing them effectively, yes, <laughs> pump the uh, 11, 13 billion, or even half of that, or, or half of that, yes. into rather Resources holding them, them up. Absolutely. But they need fit and proper persons. They are talking about persons, directors, and shareholders who are acting fraudulently. Individuals who Quick have done the wrong thing. That is what Let's individual, 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 individual yeah. who have done the wrong thing mm. must face the full rigors of the law. No mm. doubt about that. Okay. But in doing so, the institution upon whom many people depend, small businesses. I mean, we, we do all these things. Oh, small businesses are the engine of growth in this country. Yet their lifeline or the support that allows them to be the engine is being cut off into pieces and we continue to say that they are the engine of growth let's face it the biggest sector of our economy is the informal sector the formalized institutional banking sector is unable to assess them or have no interest in assessing them okay those that assess them are normally the microfinance institutions let's grant that the microfinance institutions along the way some of them have lost oh, track the whole liquidity okay. support all right so issue. so my understanding mm -hmm. is that this certainly is an issue that we need to treat in the same manner we treated when the 
the collapse began and we're discussing it, you know, and making it central and spending hours to discuss. So we will have to retable the issue because, as you can see, we just, you know, touch, scratch the surface, scratch the surface on the microfinance institutions and not even the bank that have the banks that have collapsed and the 50 directors and owners and so forth that are supposed to be uh, getting ready to face prosecution and the recoveries that have happened so far but kofi there's a correction those that are in good standing the bank of ghana says you can find them on their website i'm saying thank you thank more. you thank you very much gentlemen Abdul Malik Wekubaku, editor-in-chief of the New Crusading Guide newspaper. Dr. Michael Pesa White, research fellow, Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, former presidential staffer and former executive director of the National uh, Service Secretariat. Kofi Bento, senior vice president, Imani Africa and lawyer. Joe Jackson, director of business uh, operations, Dalex Finance Limited. He will certainly find time to join us the next time to uh, focus on this issue. Kenneth Festus B. Abuaje, uh, retired, um, retired. He's author, conflict analyst, and member, Council of Foreign Relations, Ghana. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. My outfit, as always, is by Latida. Have a good afternoon.